And um, I, I, I was wondering, you know, how, how do you talk about creativity? I and mean, it's a hard subject to to talk about. And I think it's particularly a hard subject. Often when I'm asked to talk to, you know, in universities or schools of learning, I, you know, you go in and actually everyone in the audience is average age of about sort of 18 and looks very kind of eager up at you. This is a, an intimidating audience in some ways because you're all um, clearly people who are experienced in this field and, and um, in many cases study this field. So, uh, you know, it is an interesting topic to talk about. What I want to spend uh, some time doing is, is, is four things, uh, one of which will be the, the main part of it, the interesting bit, what we call um, uh, a technique for, for producing ideas um, under this title of thinking upside down that I'll explain more about in a minute, but I'll just spend a little bit of time talking about um, the partners and Lamine and, 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 and me. As we said at the beginning, everyone says they're going to spend a little bit of time and then they spend 45 minutes talking about how great they are, but I promise um, I'm not that great, so I can't spend that long. Um, I want to spend a bit of time just touching on what do I mean by creativity and clarifying what it is we're going to cover through the rest of this uh, talk. Um, want to just touch on the way that I think we need to prepare our minds to, uh, to, 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 to go through the, the creative thinking process that we'll talk about. And then we'll get to the point of the whole thing, which is 10 ideas that are really just, I suppose, ways of thinking about problems, ways of conceiving um, creative solutions to issues or, or, or opportunities that one finds. So, yeah, I'm now running two companies in the WPP network. Both of them are what we call brand consultancy and design businesses. Uh, and, and within that spectrum, or in, under that title, we cover a spectrum of, of uh, need to provide a spectrum of services. So, 50% uh, of the business, if you like, is concerned with giving strategic advice to organisations about how their brand can give them a source of advantage in their market. Um, linking brand to commercial opportunity. And a lot of that comes through advice on brand positioning, brand strategy, how to identify, how to solve problems that say brand architecture, um, marketing strategy. And the other 50% is then about designing solutions that may um, bring that strategy alive. It could include brand identity, could include any number of different brand experiences in the online and, and, and offline world. The partners client, so there's a mix here, it kind of looked like this. Um, there are offices with partners in London, in New York and in Singapore. Uh, and the clients are really an equal mix of B2B and B2C companies um, and, and range uh, in nature from airlines to art galleries to consumer electronics companies to uh, professional services firms. So it's a very kind of discipline neutral um, firm. And, and later on at the end, if I haven't spent too long talking about other stuff, I'll show you bits and pieces of work. But, but the partners works with clients like this. Lambi Nairn, the company that I've um, taken over uh, as chief executive of it within the last uh, month, as you say, uh, it's a similar business in terms of the sort of nature of services it offers, but a quite different business sometimes in, in, in the nature of clients or media in which it operates. So actually Lambie Nairn's heritage is in uh, moving image branding and television branding, um, very famously designed the Channel 4 identity and a number of the most iconic um, BBC identities over the years. Um, designed and created and still manages the O2 uh, brand uh, identity on a global basis now owned by Telefonica and works with other organisations like um, FIFA. Um, I took that over in a month. The partners I worked for as CEO for 10 years, I was there three years before that, I joined as a brand strategist, which was odd because when I joined the company I had no idea what a brand strategist was um, because I'd spent 15 years prior to that working for uh, client organisations for big brands, for uh, Levi Strauss and Converse and others in the kind of, I suppose, day-to-day um, uh, -day, uh, brand um, delivery um, world as opposed to the agency world. What I can say about both the partners and Laminaire and something that's central to my own personal philosophy is that creativity is, is at the heart of both businesses and how they think and how they operate. These are can lions. Uh, when the film festival ships out of can um, in, in a week or so's time, the creative world and agency world moves in um, round about the middle of June, and there's a big international festival of uh, creative awards for advertising, media, PR, design, 
uh, and digital uh, agencies. The Partners has won more Lions at Cannes than any other, the Lion is the, the, the premier award, more Lions at Cannes than any other design agency worldwide. So no one can rival the Partners for its creative award performance at Cannes. And actually if you add it together, the creative awards that have been won worldwide by the Partners and Land Vinay, pretty much no other agency can rival that in any um, awards um, worldwide. So it's something, creativity is, a, is an idea that's you know, central to my philosophy, central to the philosophy um, of the agencies. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, and also what we find is that a lot of people come to us and say, how do you do it? What's your secret? What's the formula? What's the way of conceiving ideas? And before I kind of get into uh, any more of the presentation, I'm going to show you a, sh uh, a short kind of lo-fi film um, that explains the origins of what I'm going to go on to talk about subsequently. show that film, I, I look around the room and there's someone who looks exactly like the guys there in the mask. <laughs> but, but luckily today no one fits the, the bill. But you know, the, 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 the point in the film in a way is to say, you know, what is a hard question? I mean, we've spent, the partners have been going for 30 years, I mean, they've been going for 39 years. And when you're asked the question, how do you come up with your ideas? It's really hard to say, oh, here's how you do it. And we all know it's a very difficult kind of science and environment. But nonetheless, what, what, what we were encouraged to do, I suppose, by requests that we got from people, uh, not unlike that set of circumstances, was just to try and put together some of the things that help us to, to think about ideas. Um, and that's really what the rest of this um, presentation is about. I do, though, want to give some caveats on anything that I'm going to show because, you know, I think there are one or two things that one has to understand about um, certainly our approach to creativity before you start. The first is that what I'm not going to do is spend any time at all trying to define what creativity is because I think that is a, is a, that's a, probably a topic that gets debated here at, at, at great length and it, it's sometimes a, more of a rabbit hole than, a, than, than an opportunity. It depends very much on the context, what we're talking about. There's a lot of opportunity in my view for creativity and business thinking which can include everything from process and management theory um, and of course it's a completely different thing if you're talking about creativity in the context of what makes a great piece of design or a piece of advertising. What I will contend though is the essence of every great piece of creativity is an idea. And so what this um, technique, um, as we've called it here, is really about is a process of thinking about ideas. How do you get to the intellectual uh, uh, point um, of, of contentment uh, in your mind where you've got something that you would consider a good creative idea? I think it's also interesting when you look out in the world and you talk to people and you say, give me an example of a great creative idea that you've seen in the last 12 months. And people go, oh, uh, oh, 
You know, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of assumption I think we very often have that the world is full of brilliant creative ideas and inventions. I think the reality is when you think about it is they're harder to find than you think. Creativity, in my experience, is a very hard thing to talk about with examples because most of the examples you use, people go, oh, that's not that interesting. And, and, and the reality is they are very creative ideas in the context of the business problem. But I do think that, that, that you know, creativity is something that is much sought after and, and, and much harder to achieve uh, in practice. You can't always find it. Third point I would make is, although I'm going to talk about a technique for producing ideas, it's not really a technique for producing ideas. It's a series of things that might help. There is no process in creativity. We all know that the best ideas happen in unlike at unlikely times and unlikely um, places. A lot of great creative people, uh, Thomas Heatherwick and, and James Dyson amongst them, will, will say, always carry a notebook with you. Write down the things that occur to you when they occur and, and keep them. Thomas Heatherwick apparently keeps stacks of notebooks on his shelves and when he's, when he's looking for inspiration, he'll pull down something, read something that he wrote down or noted some years ago. So, so it's not a linear process and anything I tell you here today isn't going to make it so. Um, I'm not sure I agree with what it says at the top of the page. It's not magic, or well, sometimes it is. You know, it, it, it's an interesting kind of um, uh, process. There are certainly, and of course it isn't magic, there's no such thing as magic, but I do think there are times when, when ideas occur in a way that you can't quite understand. But I do think a little bit of structure can help as well. I do honestly believe you can teach anybody to be more creative than, than, than they would be in the absence of any of that. And I've spent a fair amount of time in big organizations trying to help teams think more creatively and be more creative using ideas like this. And I do think it's possible to get people to work uh, in a more creative way with a little bit of help and a little bit of thought, such as we'll try and show here. So one more quick se section, uh, what do we need, what state of mind do we need to be in to think creatively? I'm sure you've all talked at length here about the difference between the left side of the brain and its desire for logical, analytical, linear process and the right side of the brain that asks questions, uh, or at least doesn't ask questions but answers questions in a very different kind of a way. And, and of course we know that the enemy very often of a good creative process is that left side of the brain. The reason I think the left side of the brain is so much of a, of, of a problem in creative thinking is it tries to do stuff too quick. So very often as people we're trying to get to an answer before we're ready to get to the answer. So we try to, to, our, to, 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 to work out, I've had an idea, will it work? I've had an idea, what's it going to look like in practice? And actually I think that's very often wrong and what we want to be focused on much more um, is, is that right side of the brain and, and, and the questioning thing. And some of you may have seen this trick before but, but here's a trick that I think is helpful just to get us to encourage that right side of the brain to work a bit more. If we had more time I'd do this with everybody. If this was a half day workshop um, I'd say to you get out some, some pens and some paper and I want you to copy this line drawing which is um, Pablo Picasso's uh, line drawing of Igor Stravinsky uh, from 1920. And I want you to copy it using a pencil and a, and, a, and a piece of paper. And what you would find if you tried that, or what many of you would find if you tried that, is you'd start out and you'd be copying it, and at a certain point in time you'd be looking at it, and you wouldn't be too happy necessarily with the outcome. And then I would say to you, I want you to do the same exercise a second time, uh, with the same drawing, except this time the drawing is upside down. And I'd ask you to do the same thing upside down. If you did the same thing upside down, some of you, many of you, but probably not all of you, would find that actually when you'd completed it and you turned it back the other way, you'd look at it and you'd say, hey, that's actually a better copy of the drawing than I produced the first time around. And there are lots, there's lots of theory that I'm not qualified to talk about about exactly why that's the case. But the principle of why that's the case is that as we develop our brains through life, at some point through our teenage years and early adulthood, we, adulthood, we start to form perceptions about what things are and what they look like and how the world is. One of them is that we have a point of view about what a person looks like. And when someone shows us a drawing like this and says, copy the drawing of that person, what we don't do is copy the drawing. What we do do is draw what our brain thinks a person looks like. 
And the reason this exercise works when you draw it upside down is actually what your brain starts to do is to stop focusing on, does it look like a person? Does that look like a lapel? Does that look like a tie? Is that a pair of spectacles? And it actually looks at, where are the lines? What is the thing that I'm trying to do? So my perception, not everyone would find this to the same extent, but my perception of that is not as an upside down drawing of Igor Stravinsky, it's as a collection of lines. And the reason I think this is a valuable, and it's an it's a, it's a exercise, um, not, not a solution to anything, but the reason I think this is valuable is that it's, it, it's, it, it's an example of how I think we need to get our brains working when we think creatively. We need to be thinking more or without preconceptions. We need to abandon the sense of what do I think this is going to be like? What do I think the solution is before I start? We need to think a little bit more childishly sometimes. We need to trust ourselves. And importantly, we need to move step by step. When you do that drawing upside down, what you'll do is you'll look at each line one by one. You won't try and draw a jacket. You'll look at an individual line. And I think a lot of creative thinking is very much like that too. Trust yourself to do things step by step, not to try and solve the problem in one go. So all of that is all the stuff that I said you may not be um, so keen on. Excuse me. Hmm? Yeah, actually, the, the presentation crashed. So. Yeah, thank you. So now, after a short delay, um, the point of what I was going to present. So what I'm going to show you now is, 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 is um, the technique that emerged from all the requests to, to say, how do you have your ideas? Actually, again, if this was the longer workshop, we could spend a lot of time talking about a broader technique that it, it talks about how do you write a brief, how do you gather information, how do you develop ideas when you've got them. I'm not going to focus on all of that um, today, although um, there's much um, to be said for good brief writing and good uh, gathering. But what I really want to focus on are ten ideas. And ten ideas that are, I suppose, just approaches to problem solving, just ways that have helped me and helped, helped our companies to, to think about um, how you see a situation a little bit differently. When, in a design company, and, and most brand companies, I really just grown up design companies, you very often find that the people that work there are, in essence, problem solvers. Uh, give them a problem and they can solve it. So much of this is about how to solve a problem, although I think it applies equally to kind of blue sky situations or open situations where it's not necessarily a problem identified. But what I'm going to talk about then are, are, are ten different ways that I think, you, I hope that you, by thinking in that way, you come up with some more interesting answers. In each case, I'll introduce the idea and then give an example from uh, a brand in the real world that I think has done that in some way, shape or form. So the first way of thinking is really just a challenge to say, can you flip the conventions that exist in the category? Far too many businesses do things the same way just as they've always been done the same way. Far too many problems fail to be solved because people aren't prepared to, to look at the fundamentals of how things work and do them in a different way. So challenge category convention, break rules. Um, you know, very often in, in, in the business world, you know, the, the, the thing everyone's questioning for really is differentiation meaningful differentiation and compelling differentiation, you can put any number of adjectives before it, but differentiation is often the goal. You won't find differentiation if you do things the same way as everybody else has. And I think there's a lovely example of this from the washing powder category. So some years ago, I mean, the, the convention of the washing powder industry uh, is that we should all live in a sterile white world in which everything is perfectly clean all of the time and all communication and all positioning of washing uh, powder companies for many, many years was based on creating this, this world of purity, this world of whiteness that, that, that was actually at odds with the reality of how most of us live. Purcell developed a wonderful brand positioning by flipping the conventions of the category, um, by proclaiming that dirt is not the enemy, Dirt is actually our friend. Dirt is good. Dirt is the thing that encourages children to play and to learn, and it builds immunities, and, it, and it's a sign of a life 
well lit. The role of washing powder isn't to eliminate dirt from our lives forever. The role of washing powder is to allow us to engage with, 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 with uh, dirt so that it can be eliminated. Um, because it can be eliminated by washing powder. And I think that's a wonderful idea. And, and the, one of the reasons I think this is such a wonderful idea is that it's actually endured for a very long time as a positioning for that business. I, 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 I thought I'd better check that that's still the idea behind Persil today. And I went online today, and the first thing you see on the website is a scientific study backing up the argument for why dirt is a good thing in the lives of, of children as they grow up. So I love that idea of, of, of there being a, a challenge or flip to convention. I'm going to rattle through these because I, I once made a rule for myself, I've never present a list of more than seven things, which I'm breaking in this presentation. So I'm going to go through quite quickly in the interest of time, um, uh, and uh, but happy to take questions at the end. Uh, another way I think you could think about problems is, is you know, when, often when people look at a brand experience or a customer experience or a situation, you know, they'll look at the whole thing, they'll try and solve the whole thing. Very often, you don't have to. Very often, what you can solve is an element of that. But solve the thing that matters the most. You know, what is the thing that people care about? I was having a conversation uh, earlier today with, with, with Hannah over there about, um, about airlines and budget airlines. And actually, you know, budget airlines are all competing for this, that, and the other. And let's, let's take price out of the equation for a minute. The experience on a budget airline uh, on a short haul flight actually doesn't really matter that much, in my opinion, because the amount of time you're on the flight is, that, is insignificant compared to the amount of time and the hassle that you get in the airport. So, you know, sometimes looking at the nature, the critical parts of the experience yields different kinds of solutions to different kinds of problems. This is a really tiny uh, example, but it's one that I really love. There was a pizza company in Chiswick, near where I live, who opened up one day, called Clever Wally's Raw Pizza, and I drove past and thought, what on earth is Clever Wally's Raw Pizza? That's diabolical. And then the leaflet came through my door uh, later, and, and Clever Wally, uh, his proposition was that when you order a takeaway pizza, the one thing that you want, I mean the defining feature of a good pizza, is that it's hot. And the problem with almost every pizza delivery company in the world is that by the time their little moped has made it to your door, the pizza is actually cold. So Clever Wally's idea was that he would deliver you a raw pizza, you phone up and you say, I'd like that pizza please, with all the toppings, and yes, the nice dough, yes, thank you very much. You put your oven on, by the time the pizza arrives, your oven is hot, you put the pizza in the oven, it's only got to be in there for like eight minutes, and then you take it out and you've got a piping hot pizza and maybe a little great win. I thought that was a lovely way of looking at what matters most about a pizza. It's a bad example because Clever Wallace went bust. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to put that down to market forces, not the strength of the idea. Anyway, identify the critical part of the experience. So I'm going to go straight to the example on this one. In 1997, if you wanted a salad, you went to the supermarket with a greengrocer and you bought a lettuce, and you bought some cucumber, and you bought maybe some red onion, and you bought some this and some that, and da 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 da. And you went home and you laboriously prepared everything and you mixed it and you dressed it and by the time you were exhausted and you needed something more than a salad to uh, sustain you after all that and there was a whole lot of waste and blah, 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 blah. so people weren't eating salad. And then somebody said, hey, why don't we do pre-packaged salad? Why don't we take the barriers that stop people from making salad away and give them what they want as a finished product? Today, and I think this has been relatively static for about 10 years now, the pre-packaged salad market is a $3 billion industry. Out of nothing, out of something that didn't exist, out of something that came about purely because somebody said, why wouldn't people make a salad? And I think that's another great way. So sometimes great ideas come because you think of the negative, not the positive. Think of the reason why people don't do it and then solve that. Think of the thing that stops people um, from participating. And anyone that can see to three billion dollar idea as a consequence of this. Um, well done to you. A lot of people talk about psychology and human psychology and human be behavior, and of course it's fundamental to any of the interactions that, that, that any organization, any business, or any group of people create with others. But it's a good way, I think, to think about solving problems as well. Think about the mind state of people in. I mean, it's rather like the critical 
uh, experience point, there's often some very small things that can make a really big difference to the way that people perceive things. There's a real absence, in my opinion, of humanity in, in the kind of experiences, products, services, brands, communications that are created and delivered in the world. Um, a notable uh, exception to that in some ways are, are, are Virgin and Virgin Atlantic. Uh, Virgin and, and Richard Branson generally just have a fantastic ability to see things through a human uh, lens, a person to person, a person lens, not a business to person lens. Um, I think there's something really interesting though about Virgin Atlantic in particular, and this little rubber duck um, is a symbol of that. And so are the salt and pepper pots that are like, planes that you can play with. And so is the fact that they'll give you an ice cream halfway through the flight. And that's because I think they've understood the mind state of passengers. And this is all in the, the, the um, uh, business class, upper class um, service. The mind state of the passenger when you're on a transatlantic flight is the same mind, that doesn't matter how old and gnarly um, a business person you may be. Um, the mind state of the person on, on the plane is the same as the mind state of the seven or eight year old in the back of the car being taken on some other way with your parents. You're strapped into a seat, all you can see in front of you is another seat, you've got a belt around you, you can't move, it's a long way, you're not allowed to get up to go to the loo. Are we nearly there yet? It's frustrating. There's, there's a kind of maternal or paternal figure standing over you, looking down at you. You regress to childhood. And the beauty of what Virgin Atlantic did is they said, hey, you've regressed into childhood in your mind while you're there, so let's treat you like a child, but in a nice way. Let's give you a toy. Let's give you things you can play with. Let's give you ice cream. Let's do our safety videos as cartoons like you would see. And everyone said, oh, Virgin Atlantic is so great. And a lot of it is, you know, subtle things and the fun and the, the kind of glamour of it. But I think they've done a great job there of really understanding the psychology of the situation. There's no doubt in my mind that every great solution starts with a fundamental understanding of the, 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 um, the end user or the consumer, the customer, call them what you will, of people. And the deeper you can make that, the more profound I think your solution can be. Here's another great story. I'm sure all of you know this, but it never ceases to amaze me how many people don't know this story, because when you know it, it's bound obvious that this is the story. Um, in, in the 1920s, Michelin wanted to sell more tyres. That was their business, selling tyres. How could you sell more, more car tyres? And in the 1920s, the way to sell more tyres wasn't particularly complicated. You just had to get people to drive a little bit further, because rubber compounds weren't particularly sophisticated and wore down very quickly. So the way to get people to buy more tires was to get them to drive a little bit further. So they conceived a guide to restaurants. And the guide to restaurants was conceived as a, as, as a driver's aid. So there were three categories of restaurants. A one-star restaurant was one that if you were on a trip and the restaurant was en route, then it was worth stopping at. A two-star restaurant was one that if you were on a trip and there was a small detour required to get to the restaurant, it was worthy of a detour. And a three-star restaurant was a restaurant that was worthy of a special trip in itself. So you get up on Sunday and you drive to the restaurant. Now, we all know the Michelin Guide today is the kind of ultimate arbiter, if you like, a, a great restaurant. Chefs clamor for the prestige of two or three stars, or one or two or three stars. And we think of it as being something that was invented actually as a guide to restaurants. It wasn't invented as, a, as an aid to diners or to chefs. It was invented to sell tires. But it's assumed a different level of import as time has gone on. If you look in the guide, you'll still see the classifications are exactly the same. Worthy of a stop en route, worthy of a detour, or worthy of a special trip. So, so the three-star restaurant is still defined in those ways. It's a lovely example, though, of solving a problem by getting people to do something else. By getting people to go and have a nice lunch, we persuaded them to buy more tires. And, and, and I think, you know, over time, there's been a sort of bifurcation of, of, of purpose between the selling of tires and the, and, and the, uh, the restaurant guide, and, and yet its origins are that, a, a purely commercial purpose. So how do you turn choice into necessity and get people to do something by getting them to do something else? In a lot of areas of business, 
there are a lot of kind of oddities to categories. They very often get ignored and, 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 and left behind. And I think actually very often you can find solutions to problems by looking at the idiosyncrasies of categories. This is another quite small example, but I do like it as a way of thinking. Um, it's a set of stamps that were launched actually a little while ago now. I think this is probably five or six years ago um, at least. But it came from an observation that says, what is a stamp? And a stamp is a small sticky thing with a face on it. Ultimately, that's what it is. So the designer of these stamps actually said, okay, if it's a small sticky thing with a face on it, what else could I do with a small sticky thing with a face on it? And just conceived these, these fruit faces. The way these work is you buy a set of stamps and you get some fruit, and then you get a separate thing that's got some eyes on it, and a separate thing that's got some hats and some spectacles and some ties and so forth. And then when you send a letter, you just put on a fruit and you make your own faces and it's, it's a small example, it's a very sweet example, it's very well creatively award, creative awarded actually, but um, a lovely example for me of how to exploit nuances or, or oddities that help you to, to make things feel different and be more fun. I talk about this a lot with people, there are presentations I make about um, you know, the fundamental principles of brands and the seven laws of this and this, that and the other and almost every time I make a presentation like that I say it's got to be fun guys, it's got to be fun because Certainly in the brand and marketing world, if it isn't fun, we're not doing our job right. Uh, number seven, businesses uh, are great at ignoring the real issues. But their businesses are great at setting out processes and, and, and strategies and um, putting project teams in place and you know, running on stuff and actually ignoring the big issues that are there. I mean, and, and, and I think all too often, certainly in the business that I'm in, we're presented with problems by clients where the thing that they tell us is, is, is the problem really isn't the problem at all. The problem is something else that they've chosen to ignore. I mean, sometimes the problem is that actually their product's no good. Sometimes the, 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 the problem is that their marketing's rubbish. Sometimes the problem is you know, that, that, that consumers just aren't interested uh, anymore. So honesty, you know, being prepared to address the big issues is that. Now, people have written extensively, quite rightly, about what made Apple successful. And of course, no one knows that one answer to that. There are a multiplicity of reasons. But you know, I do think there was a moment in time where Apple made that jump from being a business that was poised for, for, for greatness into a business that was genuinely great. And actually, I think it was the point where, where this product, the, the first iMac, um, launched because what it did was identify something really obvious that had been ignored by the industry for 30 years previously and that was that if you wanted a computer not just at work but but but, but at home as well you didn't actually want it to look like that because what the the, the, the kind of language of that design language of that computer is something that's alienating it feels like it's deathly dull and boring. What you want a computer to do is the fun stuff. You want it to facilitate your life. You want it to be a sign of your, certainly in that era, a sign of your um, progressiveness and your opportunity in life. And the simple act of producing brightly colored, beautifully designed products, I think, is a massive step forward in Apple's uh, journey towards greatness. I think the same is true of the iPod and the iPhone uh, and many other things as well. As I say, you can't attribute, and I would never want to attribute the whole of Apple's success to that one moment, but I do think it's a great example of just being prepared to address a fundamental issue or fundamental truth and come up with a, a solution that is profound in its nature. So, uh, again, let me go straight to the example 1933, and if you wanted to travel on the London Underground, you'd get a map that looked like this, which was produced the same way that maps were always produced, which was the lines on the underground kind of track where they actually went. And as the underground system was getting more complex and London was getting more dense, the map was becoming increasingly difficult to follow uh, and increasingly less user-friendly. And then along came a guy called Harry Beck, who had trained as an electrical draftsman. And as an electrical draftsman, he was used to drawing diagrams like this that didn't actually show where wires went in reality. It was just a schematic that said, where do they need to connect? And he said, if I apply those principles to the London Underground system, I can produce a map that, that today looks like this and, and simplify the whole system dramatically. Of course, it was true that no one really needs to know if you're here, whether it's actually there or whether it's actually there, that's irrelevant because you're underground. What you need to know is where does it connect. 
So the lesson here was, what do you learn from, from or what do you borrow, what do you learn from another category? An electrical draftsman sees map drawing in a completely different way than a map maker does, and therefore we produce a map. That map is now 81 years old. Last year, a whole lot of people, you know, on its 80th birthday, said, oh, I think we could do a better version of this. Of course, no one's succeeded. Um, I've no doubt there will be a better version. But, but borrowing from other categories, finding kind of contrast or tensions that, 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 that exist between one way of looking at it and another way of looking at it, often very good ways, I think, of solving brand problems or business problems creatively. Turning negatives into positives. I feel like um, this kind of half history uh, lecture, this. So now it's 1962, I think, um, and Hertz are the number one uh, car rental company in the US by some margin, and Avis are number two. And they desperately need to take that number one position or to raise their sales and get some growth, so they call in, um, they call in DDB, um, uh, one of the most famous advertising agencies of the era, and they say, can you work with us? And by the way, we've only got one-fifth of the marketing budget of, of Hertz and DDB say, well, we will work with you, but only if you accept the first idea that we give you, um, because we're not, you know, for that budget, we're not interested in going through a kind of da -da 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 -da. So away you go the agency, and they came back with the, with the positioning that said, we're number two, so we try harder. And the organization said, mm, don't like it. And they put it into research, and the research came back, and the research said, mm, don't like it. Uh, and DDB said, well, you know, we told you how it was going to be, guys, so um, this is what you've got. So they said, okay, we'll run it anyway. I think it's one of the greatest positioning ideas of all time. Just the notion, the promise to customers, to clients, that said, we try harder for you because we're not the complacent market leader, we're trying harder for you, we're doing more. Um, for you. It endures to this day. I think last year or the year before, there was a new CMO who came into Avis who said, we're going to leave behind the we try harder thing. I'm not sure if they've yet abandoned the leave behind, but I, I, I would be pretty confident that they can go back to that at some point in time. So a lovely example of turning weaknesses into advantage. Very often, I think, in a brief, certainly the things that we see, People will say, yeah, well, you know, the thing that you've got to be concerned about is, you know, this, this thing here, like, don't, don't leave that thing aside because we're not, we're not happy about that bit. Very often, the solution to, to a situation or an idea in a situation comes out of being able to take the negative and to spin it into a positive, as this did. So asking yourself what's the most unlikely source of advantage is not a bad place to start. And then finally, and a lot of these ideas I've talked about kind of cross over into each other because they're, they're not intended to be unique ideas. Because I said before, they're not intended to be a linear process. They're just different ways that you can think about working. And this one, in a way, is almost like a kind of, kind of meta idea in some ways. I think this is something that should always be asked. 90% of problems don't ask the right question, in my opinion. They ask the wrong question or they just subtly miss uh, the point of the question. It's always worth, in my experience, spending a lot of time interrogating the problem before you even start to think about what a solution might be, or reframing or, 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 or setting different goals. I think this is a nice story of that with Lucas A. When I was a kid growing up, if I was ill and feeling a little under the weather and I'd be lying in bed, that's not me, by the way, um, that's uh, it's far better looking kid than I was. Um, but, you know, I'd be lying in bed and my, my, my mother or my father would bring me a glass of Lucozade and it was a tonic for sick kids. It was just a, a, it was a sugar-filled drink that just made you feel better for a little period of time. No medicinal value, but just kind of perked you up to an extent. Lucozade reaches a point, of course, where that's a declining market and it wasn't a particularly big market anyway, and then said to itself, well, how do we, how do we develop this business? How do we take this business forward? Took the same essence of a product, which is a sugary drink that, 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 that provides you with an instant hit uh, of energy, and just found a new context for it. Actually, there was a, a I don't know how true this is, um, but I'm going to believe it's true. There was a, a marketing director came in and said, I want to see empty bottles of Lucozade lying by the side of the road. And you can imagine the thought process that said, well, if they, how would they get by the side of the road if someone would have to be in the road? Who is in the road that would drink Lucozade? Well, maybe runners. And I just kind of think that thought process 
um, true or otherwise, um, is a sort of thought process that very often helps. If you can reframe the problem, if you can describe your problem in a different way, it can sometimes lead you through a chain of thought to a different um, solution. Of course, you could say it's a fabulously successful brand uh, in many ways today. So, those are 10 ideas um, summarized on, uh, on a single page, and I think it's all being filmed, so you have to look at the video if uh, you want to um, catch them back again. I thought if you'll indulge me, I'll very quickly skip you through some of the work that, that, that I've been a part of, it's all actually from the partners in this case, um, that I think brings that alive. And I'm going to go through very quickly, but I thought I ought to put at least some evidence up that, that, that we've used this at some point. So this is a very well awarded piece of work for the National Gallery in London, um, where we were given a brief to create a new brand identity and communication idea for the gallery that would persuade people who thought they weren't interested in old master paintings to come to the gallery to see old master paintings. So we did the stupidest thing you could possibly do, and we said we're going to have a campaign that doesn't use paintings and doesn't use pictures. Because if you've already decided that you're not interested in old master painting, showing you a picture of a painting, which is in itself not as good as a painting, isn't going to get you there. So it was a lovely example, I think, of trying to defy the convention of a category and doing something that on the face of it is a bit stupid. This was for uh, uh, the, the material that went out for a campaign of Rubin's early work, which is quite dark and terrible. Um, in many ways. Now we could have put up a picture of a, a Rubens painting and people would have gone, oh, Rubens painting. Or we could say an infant is torn limb from limb, the dirty floor is strewn with tireless, uh, lifeless bodies, a mother screams. It's an epic scene of dark and terrible beauty. And straight away, the mind frame changes a little bit. And, and actually, there was a fabulous uptake of uh, people going to the gallery as, as a result of this. We then went on. Um, and reframed the problem again because we had a second problem that said um, well the same brief in many ways but how can we get more people to come to the gallery to see the paintings and, 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 and at one point we said actually you know what let's turn that brief on its head as well so let's look at how can we take the paintings to the people so we took 44 life size um, reproductions of paintings um, and put them on the streets of, uh, of, of London and I'm not play the whole film here but you know, the idea was just to create a gallery that lived in, um, uh, around the streets of London, finding places that lent themselves naturally to the presence of the painting, either because the aesthetic of the, of, of, of the space was there or because there was a natural dialogue between the content of the painting and the content um, uh, or, or the story of the area that it was placed in. I'm going to just skip through um, quickly on that. This is a piece of work that we did. Uh, for a, a, a group of a consortium for street children, which was funded by a number of, uh, a, a, of organisations, of either actually were a participant in this, which raised, is campaigning to raise awareness of children living on the streets um, all around the world and, and trying to raise that as an issue um, amongst big um, funding bodies. And what we took here was the idiosyncrasies of, of, of a child's bedroom, the visual language of a child's bedroom, and just played that out as a a, a, a kind of big um, sort of street furniture uh, idea. So kids' bedroom signs. Um, so to me, this is the, this point about finding the idiosyncrasies of a category and then playing with them, exploiting them, and um, a huge visibility actually that this campaign got to raise uh, awareness through doing something in a different way. Um, sometimes our clients are big corporates. Deloitte. Um, uh, employee now about 220,000 people around the world at the point this we did this work it's about 160,000 they came to us and they said can we have a screensaver that helps communicate our corporate values one of which was about uh, their, their environmental responsibility and we said no you can't have a, a screensaver let's get people to understand that value by getting them to do something else so this film tells the story of how we address that
so the data in that film was part of the kind of, if you like, a sell to them to say this is what you could achieve. But the uptake was astonishing. So one year after it had launched, which happened to be World Earth Day, they calculated that in one year they'd saved enough energy to power a family home for something like 23 years. And, and, it, was a and it started from a brief that says we have a corporate screen set with some words that might bounce around the screen. So again, we're looking at a way to solve a problem by getting people to do something else. And also that point about having a slightly higher purpose for things, which there also was, there's not all the stuff we do is big and corporate. Some of it's very kind of sweet. This is literally quite sweet because it's honey. This is honey that's, that, that's produced by urban bees. So bees that fly around London um, finding their sources of pollen from the parks and, and so forth. And we were asked to design some packaging. Um, for it, but we actually kind of felt, well, you know, you could design packaging and you could have, like, you know, whatever you want on the box, but maybe there's another way to think about this. So we thought about it from the perspective of the bee. We said, if you are an urban <coughs> bee flying around looking for pollen, it's a pretty, pretty tough gig, actually. There's not a lot of sources of, uh, of, of, um, uh, of flowers and pollen for you. So actually, the honey um, packaging was a flower pot. And the honey was inside in a, in a bag which you pulled out and then underneath the bag uh, was a little uh, um, pack of seeds which you could put some earth in and grow and then hey presto create the, the source of pollen for the bees of the future. I, I can't imagine there's one single person in the whole world who bothered to plant seeds and, and grow the flower but the idea lives by itself and, and, and in some ways the story of the idea and something like that is more important than the idea itself. And one more just little fun idea to finish with. This is a cleaning company called Eagle Clean. And, and this is a, an identity we developed for them that rather wittily, I suppose, plays on the idea of a bird um, using the rubber gloves. But actually the joy of this one, the humanity of this idea came when they said, oh, and what would you do on our website? So we said, well, you know, I'm sure we could do something interesting on the website. And we created this, which is a, a website that um, actually <laughs> cleans itself from the inside and it's in the world of kind of digital interactivity where everyone's kind of looking for yeah what's the what are we doing html5 and our flash is dead and this that and the interactive and ui and da, 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 all these conversations go on a sweet little human idea like this that makes people laugh and smile is often the best way to to, to cut through it doesn't matter uh, how complex and, 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 and how sophisticated the technology is so long as you come up with something that just um, works. So, that's it.